Hi and welcome to our next podcast on medical statistics. Last time we looked at hypothesis testing, this time we're going to go on to think a bit more about hypothesis testing, particularly in the context of sampling. First, let's remind ourselves of um, the process that we came up with last time for doing hypothesis testing. The first thing we said we needed to do was to have a well-formed clinical question, and we looked at how to, to come up with good clinical questions in our first podcast. From that, we could come up with a research hypothesis. And you remember that um, the example we used last time was of an imaginary health product called SodiBind, and our research hypothesis was that um, serum sodium levels in those taking SodiBind are lower than serum sodium levels in the general population. Now, if it happens that we know the distribution of serum sodium levels in uh, those taking SodiBind and in the general population, then our job is easy. We just compare the two. Um, however, if we don't know one of the distributions, um, then we proceed along different lines. We set up what's called the null hypothesis. Um, now, this was the status quo. So in our example, it would be that um, serum sodium levels in those taking sodium binds were exactly the same as serum sodium levels in the general population. And then we go on to um, look at what we do know about the unknown population um, and ask about ask what are the chances of observing this under the null hypothesis. Um, and from that, uh, we can work out a p-value. Um, and typically we say that we reject the null hypothesis if the p-value is less than 0.05. Although we talked last week about the fact that that's a bit of an arbitrary distinction. But nevertheless, it's one which is commonly used. Now, last time we had a bit of an unusual situation in that um, we only had um, one item of data. We had a friend who decided to give us a sample of his serum sodium, um, and that's all we knew about the sodium bind population. But we knew quite a lot about sodium in the normal population, um, because we deal with that every day, and we know what the normal range is, and we know it's distributed normally. So how do we deal with a situation where we're designing an experiment or a trial and we're going to have more than one particip participant. Um, well, in that case, we need to think about sampling. So let's talk about some definitions. And to help us think about them, I'm going to use yet another made-up example. So this time, suppose that you're working in colorectal surgery. You have a particular interest in anal fissure. Um, and you've been thinking about a, a research project for a while. Um, and what you want to study is the research hypothesis that people with anal fissure have a lower quality of life than uh, the general population. So you'd go through and you'd have your study population, which is people with anal fissure. If you wanted to, you could limit it down. So you could say people in the United Kingdom with anal fissure or people in Derbyshire with anal fissure, whatever you like. So that's the population you're interested in. A sample, then, is any subgroup of the population. And in theory, you could form that subgroup in, in any way that you wanted. So if you wanted to, you could say your sample is going to be people with anal fissure who are more than five foot six tall. Or you could say people with anal fissure who have blue eyes. Um, or you could, if you wanted to, walk out into the local street, stop people at random, um, ask them if they have anal fissure, and then if they do have anal fissure, you could add them to your sample. These would all be ways of forming a sample from our population. But what they wouldn't be um, would be representative samples. So a representative sample is a sample whose characteristics accurately represent the characteristics of the patient population. So for instance, if you chose as your sample everybody who turned up to your clinic with anal fissure, then I put it to you that that wouldn't be a representative sample because really the people who make it to colorectal clinic uh, with anal fissure have probably already been through primary care and by the time they've made it to you, then they probably uh, have more uh, severe disease than uh, your average person with anal fissure. So that wouldn't be a representative sample. A random sample is when you devise some way to pick um, people entirely at random from your population and put them together as your sample. And random sampling, if it's truly random, has the benefit that it is representative. Two more terms I want to talk about are parameter and statistic. Um, so 
when we talk about a characteristic of the population, say the average quality of life score or the mean quality of life score in our population, um, that is technically referred to as a parameter. So um, characteristics of the population are called parameters, whereas characteristics of um, a sample are called statistics. So the average quality of life in our sample would be a statistic. It's semantics, really, um, but it's something that it's useful to know because it pops up all the time um, when you're reading about statistics. So that's the difference between a parameter and a statistic. So let's make the example slightly more contrived for our purposes. Suppose that, in fact, you live in a small island, and what you don't know is that on your small island there live 1,000 people with anal fissure. And also you don't know, um, but this is the distribution of their quality of life scores. Now, if you were to work out the mean and the standard deviation of these quality of life scores, what you would get is a mean of 5 and a standard deviation of 2.43. Okay, but you don't know this. So you um, are in your clinic or whatever sampling method you've decided to use, and you pick 10 people. That's the sample size you're going to use. Um, and you work out the mean and the standard deviation. Um, if you wanted to, you could repeat the experiment, pick another 10 people, work out the mean and standard deviation. And you could repeat that over and over again. And you would get a bunch of means and you would get a bunch of standard deviations. Now, what you would find if you looked at these different means is that they would cluster somewhere around 5. That's kind of what you'd expect them to do. The mean of the whole population is 5. If you took lots of samples from the whole population, you find a mean which clusters around 5. Good. What happens with the standard deviations? Well, if you were to repeat your experiment lots of times, what you would find is that the standard deviation of these samples um, clusters around 1.9. Now that's slightly surprising. Um, you might expect that the standard deviation that you work out for your samples would cluster at about 2.43, but that's not the case. Now this brings us to the subject of what are called biased and unbiased estimators. The sample mean is an unbiased estimator, and that's because um, if you do repeat the sample lots and lots of times, we find that the mean clusters around the mean of the population. So our statistic, the sample mean, um, tends to estimate a parameter, the population mean, in an unbiased way. However, standard deviation is a biased estimator in that the statistic, which is if you work out the standard deviation of the sample, tends to underestimate our parameter, which is the standard deviation of the whole population. There is an unbiased estimator for the population standard deviation, um, and that's a quantity which is called the, the sample standard deviation. Now, I have to apologise. I think I said in the first podcast that I was going to try and avoid equations, but this slide um, contains a couple. Now, the caveat is that you don't need to memorise these by any way. Um, so this is an equation for um, the standard deviation um, of a set of values. So it's the difference from the mean, you square them, add them together, divide them by the number of values, and then take the square root. And this, this is our unbiased estimator um, for the population standard deviation. Here's the formula for the sample um, standard deviation. And you can see it, it's exactly the same, except uh, the denominator in our um, equation here is n minus 1. And this now gives us an unbiased estimator uh, for the, the parameter that is the population standard deviation. Like I say, you don't need to memorize that. It was just for those who might be interested. OK, so we're going to return to the example of SODIBIND um, to help us think about how we do hypothesis testing when we're dealing with a, a sample from our unknown distribution. So suppose it's um, a year or two later and you go to your next school reunion. Your friend is still selling SODIBIND, um, but this time he's been in contact with all of his customers and they've agreed to give him um, samples that can be tested to find out what their serum serum sodium is, um, and he has agreed to, he has agreed to select four of those samples at random, give them to you so that you can then go on and, and test them for their serum sodium. So we're going to take the four samples that our friend gives us. We're going to work out their serum sodium, and then we're going to take the mean of those, and that will give us a number. And the question is, how do we go about hypothesis testing with this? Well, if the null hypothesis is true, then we're going to assume that um, the distribution of sodium levels in those taking sodium bind is the same as the general population. And so each of those 
four samples that we've been given by our friend, we're going to assume is an individual from the general population. Now we know what that looks like, that's a normal distribution with a mean of 140 and a standard deviation of 3. But we're not just looking at individuals here, we're looking at uh, the mean of four individuals from that population. And so the question we really need to ask is what's the distribution of means of four people from the general population? So um, if you take four people from the general population and average their serum sodium levels, and then take another four people from the general population and average their serum sodium levels, keep on doing that over and over and over and over again, what do these average sodium levels look like? Because that's what we want to compare um, the, the result we've got from the four samples our friend has given us to. Um, so this distribution is called the sampling distribution of the mean. So if we take samples of size 4 from the general population um, over and over again, the distribution of those means is called the sampling distribution of the mean. And it's that that we want to compare um, our sample with. Now whilst um, we know what the distribution of serum sodium levels in the general population is, it's got a mean of 140, standard deviation 3, and it's normally distributed, we don't know um, what this sampling distribution of the mean looks like. We don't know what the distribution when we continually take samples of size 4 from the general population looks like. And that's what we need to know um, to compare with the sample that we're getting from our friend. Uh, now thankfully there's a, a relatively important theorem from statistics that comes to our rescue here. And it's called the central limit theorem. Now I'm not going to go um, into all of its details. And what I'm presenting here is, is just a simplified version of it. So what it says is that provided that we have um, a large sample size, and people would vary on what they describe as large, but certainly a sample size of greater than 100, and some people would say a sample size of greater than 50, um, then the sample mean is normally distributed. Now, it doesn't matter um, what the, the population you're taking your sample mean from looks like. Um, nevertheless, the sample mean is normally distributed. What's more, the mean um, of this sampling distribution is the same as the mean of our original population. Um, and the standard deviation of our sampling mean is firstly called the standard error, we don't call it the standard deviation, and secondly, it's equal to the standard deviation of our original population divided by the square root of the sample size. So let's return to our sodium binding example. Suppose that um, your friend gives you four samples from his customers, um, you test them and you find out that the sodium levels are um, 132, 133, 135 and 147. And that gives it um, a mean of 135. How do we do our hypothesis test? So our null hypothesis is still that um, the distribution of sodium levels is the same in the general population as it is in the sodium population. So what we're looking to see is if it's likely that our sample of four sodium bind takers comes from the general population. But what we're going to compare it with this time is the sampling distribution of the mean for sample sizes of four. And now we know what that distribution looks like because the central limit theorem tells us what it is. So it tells us that the mean is the same, so the mean is 140, and the standard deviation, or what we call in this case the standard error, is 1.5. That's um, the standard deviation of our original population, 3, divided by the square root of the sample size. And the sample size in this case is 4. Um, so uh, we know what the sampling distribution of the mean looks like. It looks a bit like this. And as you can see, if we plot on, um, our, our score of 135.5 lies way off to the left. In fact, it's three standard errors below the mean, so that would give it a Z score of minus 3, which would be a p-value of 0 0.0013. And so in this case, we would reject the null hypothesis and say that sodibind works. So I'm sorry, but even more equations, just as a summary. So on the top line, uh, we've got the formulae for uh, 
the population mean and the population standard deviation. Um, and remember that these are parameters um, and the capital N that's used there um, would be the, the number of people in the whole population. Um, on the second line, we have the equations for the sample mean um, and then also the sample standard deviation, which remember is this unbiased estimator that uses a denominator of n minus 1. And this little n here um, refers to the, the number of people in your sample. And then on the third line, we've got a reminder um, of what the central limit theorem tells us, which is that the, uh, the mean of the sampling distribution of the mean is the same as the mean of the general population, and that's just mu. And it tells us that the standard deviation, or what we call the standard error, of the sampling distribution of the mean is what you get by dividing uh, sigma by the square root of n, which is your sample size in this case. So there we go. I hope that makes sense. Um, and we've gone through an overview of how you go about doing hypothesis testing uh, when you have a sample. Um, we've introduced the idea of the sampling distribution of the mean and we've also come across the central limit theorem. Okay, so next time it's more hypothesis testing um, and we're going to introduce uh, the t-distribution and student's t-test.